Greetings everyone from Bloemfontein in South Africa. My name is Joan Marston. I'm uh, the Vice President of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation um, of the US. And the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation was set up to preserve and promote the legacy of the incredible work that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has done. And we are all enthusiastic and uh, supporters of her work but we also recognize that she was far more than the five stages that the world seems to think about of her, in that she was a humanitarian at a very young age. She went out into Europe after the Second World War to help refugees and to work amongst the humanitarian need that was so great after that. She was very, very strong-willed. When her father wanted her to be a secretary, she said, oh no. She went on and became a doctor. And of course, the amazing work that she did, which taught us to listen to the stories and the voices of those who are dying. She was also a great champion of those with HIV and AIDS, and she suffered so much because of that. And so um, while we promote the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, we also recognize the tremendous work that is done by so many others, and we collaborate and work together with those who want to promote the field of palliative care and the needs of the dying. A little bit about my work. I live in South Africa and 24 years ago I started a children's hospice and went on and then started doing work for children, including the, the, the work of dealing with children who were go, going through loss and grief and children who were dying as well. Um, and went on to work in different countries and internationally as well. So in South Africa, we have a national children's palliative care network, which is the strongest in Africa. And part of our work, of course, is dealing with the emotional side of the care of, of very ill children, um, dealing with their loss, dealing with their parents' loss, and also supporting the staff and the carers who are involved in this final journey of the child. Um, and so the work that we do is face-to-face, -face. it's absolute hands-on caring, it is educational and research, um, and we learn so much from the children. I always say that they teach us. When I went into this field, I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew about pediatrics and I'd had my own children. But everything that I've learned about how children feel, how they experience and how they express their feelings has come from the children themselves. And so the work that we do is with the seriously ill children in the community in Sunflower House. We work on memory work. We have a wall of remembrance where the children know their name is going to be there and we will remember them forever. Um, but we work most of all to help preserve their childhood, to allow them and enable them to be children for as long as they possibly can and to live as well as possible. Um, and so we try to keep them as part of the community, as part of the family, um, and support and involve not just the child, but the family as well. And of course, the family and the child support us in our work. Um, and so I think I'll leave for the next person to tell us about their amazing work. Um, but we do a lot of education. We have online education as well, coming from South Africa. Should I go next? Okay. Hi, I'm Smriti. Um, I'm speaking to you from the jungles of South India and I work with uh, Pallium India. I head the policy um, division as well as the strategic partnerships and community engagement because we strongly believe that in addition to um, facilitating access to essential medicines for palliative care and capacity building as well as working with policymakers, a very, very important component of care delivery in palliative care is demand generation from the community, because unless the, there is community participation, then uh, healthcare is not complete. And um, I'm trained as a psychologist. I've worked in palliative care now for 19 years, and I am particularly uh, grateful to be given this opportunity to be part of this, uh, this panel. 
uh, we in India have ranked very low on the quality of death index. And it is something that we are particularly concerned with in the palliative care community in India. And um, we work uh, to advocate for people with lived ex experiences, especially because their voices are so important. And also to facilitate access to opioid analgesics for pain relief, not just in India, but also in the Southeast Asian region. And being a WHO collaborating center for training and policy on access to pain relief, um, we really, our work works on, I mean, our, our work is centered around the demonstrate, educate and facilitate models. So while we demonstrate our work, we reach out to about 4,000 patients and their families in the Trivandrum uh, re, uh, city region in South India. We also believe that uh, capacity building at every level, not just doctors and nurses, but also allied healthcare workers, as well as advocacy skill building amongst the community is really important and to facilitate access to quality care. Um, advanced care planning in India is, uh, is making great progress under the leadership of some organizations and individuals, and we're part of that conversation. And in addition to that, I think a strong um, aspect of our work, a touchstone of our work is improving the aspect of shared decision-making, where people and their families are part of the uh, decision-making process in what offers them quality care, not just prolonging life at any cost. So um, I'm very happy to be part of this discussion and I hope Eric can contribute. Yes, hello. It's, uh, my name is Marie-Claire. I'm from Lebanon. So I'm a palliative care nurse. Uh, I started as a intensive care nurse. I worked for years in intensive care. And I always believe that the patient is, uh, is with us even if, if he's in the end of life. And it, I was always triggered to know more about end of life. And I did my studies as palliative care nurse in France. And I had the chance to, to be a co-founder of the first palliative care uh, home hospice in Lebanon. And now actually I'm in, uh, I'm working in a university hospital where we started the project of palliative care. But uh, we are doing small steps in Lebanon. We still have a lot to do. Uh, and uh, my aim mostly is to say that palliative care is not the end of life. It's helping people to live till the end. And this is, uh, this is not easy to do because uh, when, they, when they, the patient is referred, oh, he's already palliative care. So we try to explain and tell them, no, he's starting something nice till to, to do all the way, to walk all the way. Or, so we can do, we walk with them all the way till the end. And, uh, we are, and I'm so happy I started this, following the sessions of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation two years, uh, since 2020. And since that time, I feel her spirit working with me every day. And I use her words. I mean, not her words, but I use what she, she tried to tell me. And it helps me a lot to help the families because the families need to be to be, uh, not to feel alone if you want and not to have the guilt feeling. And uh, and I, I insist always that the patient is our teacher. We don't have to do the steps for him. We don't have, we can't, we're not supposed to decide for them. And this helped them a lot to accept what's going on. So, and I'm so happy to be part of this panel today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hi everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Christian Izimira. Um, greetings from Rwanda, uh, the country of Thousand Hills. Um, if you don't know where Rwanda is located, is um, is one of the smallest country in Africa and Central Africa, East Africa, uh, but not a small nation. Um, I'm, my background is the palliative care physician. Uh, and I'm an executive director and also the founder of the African Center for Research on End of Life Care, which is a nonprofit organization uh, based in Kigali in Rwanda. 
And the vision came when um, after my study in, uh, in Boston, came back home and uh, just realized uh, most of the model of care we have in Africa is uh, duplication from Euro and American uh, model of care, which time times uh, becoming conflicting because the perception of death and dying uh, has to be contextualized and localized. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the social culture, social culture part of uh, the patient um, and the family members removed the dignity and the sense of humanity of, uh, of those patients uh, because uh, palliative care are so focused on medication and that we forget that, uh, um, but forget that we can treat the disease without treating the person, but uh, it's really difficult to treat the person without treating the disease as well. So, and we, we now uh, starting a, um, a movement uh, uh, called Ubuntu Palliative Care Movement, uh, because Ubuntu is one of uh, the uh, African philosophy rooted in an African perception of uh, even from death and dying. Uh, Ubuntu, um, I can't translate it because if I translate, I would be trait. Uh, the, 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 the meaning, uh, but I can explain. Uh, Ubuntu means um, I am what I am because of you. So people are people through other people. So it's not about me, it's about us. And uh, one of my, um, my advocacy and uh, uh, my motivation is uh, to making sure that when we talking about uh, patient-centered care, uh, normally in our context is community-centered care. So because we don't define a patient as a, an isolate component, patient is part of the ecosystem of, uh, of the society. So uh, by, by trying to isolate the patient, we're trying to dehumanize uh, the, 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 the patient and also the family member. So uh, we hope our, uh, the center will be contributing uh, with, uh, from the lot of work have been done by Elizabeth Kubler-Rose, Dime C.C. Saunders, uh, and uh, other pioneer in uh, palliative care around the world. And um, I came just, we came just with uh, two major questions in our work. Uh, I'm not sure if I will respond to all those two questions. <laughs> Maybe I will, I will, it will take like two or three generations for that. But uh, the two question is, how do African patients die? And how would African patients would like to die? Because one of the, those questions have never been answered based on my small experiences, because sometimes we use, we duplicate. And I strongly believe that uh, Education doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean duplication, but rather than adaptation uh, under that context. So I'm really happy to be here and uh, to hear from your experiences and uh, bring my small contribution. Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone. My name is Keshav Sharma. I. Uh, I'm from India, working in uh, the capital of the country, Delhi. And uh, I have been uh, trained and uh, received my education in psycho-oncology. So I work as a psycho-oncologist, uh, mainly uh, work with cancer patients. Uh, my experience has been of nine years and uh, in the last nine years, working very, very closely with the cancer patients, the understanding comes on uh, seeing because in India, most of the cases uh, we see come up in the later stages at advanced stages of cancer due to uh, various reasons. And uh, my interest in palliative care has been uh, from the very beginning, I, my introduction to cancer was also through the palliative care. And uh, if I look back, my first introduction to grief and everything was when I was 14, 15, uh, I read uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's On Death and Dying. And then multiple experiences in life keeps happening and they kept strengthening the belief in uh, working on those areas. 
my special uh, interest in palliative care again is uh, an end of life care is working on children uh, because often i think it's not uh, india it's all over the world that we do not involve children in the process of grief we do not involve them in, in a lot of uh, things that are happening inside the homes especially when it comes on death and dying uh, i have been working uh, in a different cultures different setups within india i have uh, practiced for some times in the southern part of the country and uh, for few years in the north northern eastern part of the country and currently i'm practicing in the, the north northern part of the uh, nation uh, the whole idea is again to understand different cultures uh, within the within one nation uh, like you know someone said that india itself is a it, it's a nation of various continents itself so we have uh, various various different cultures and that has brought up a lot of light on understanding and it keeps every day uh, like uh, john just uh, mentioned that we learn from our patients uh, i will not say that i learned a lot from books or trainings as much i learned from each patients of mine and uh, thanks to ken ross i did connect with him a uh, few weeks back and that's how i think he connected me with vilka and i'm i'm really happy and glad to be here and uh, i would like to hear from all of you your perspectives thank you thank you for having me here thank you all so much um my name is vilka roig and i am in central mexico i am the president of the elizabeth kubler ross chapter in central mexico I am also the deputy director of education of the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation, and um, <clears throat> I'm a transpersonal psychologist. I'm a death doula and a grief counselor, and um, I love hearing from each of you just to consider how culture and community play such an important part in how we adapt. You know what we our mission to to the needs of our people and in mexico it's interesting that the biggest strength and influence uh, of elizabeth kula ross's work has been in grief work um uh, and in tanatology and there is a very strong movement and a very strong um presence of tanatology and and that is what most people connect elizabeth kula ross to here in mexico uh the palliative care and hospice aspect of her legacy has been a little bit more of a challenge because of uh cultural differences in this country and so right now uh our palliative care situation is is not great and this is something that we are beginning to work with for us we have to change the perspective about what that is right um in mexico there is an assumption even within the medical community that the palliative care physicians are the ones who bring the morphine and you know and there's all this association with with it as a as a drug and you know so so there's there's some belief systems that need to be softened so that we can be more um have a, a more influential presence as palliative care Uh, bringing palliative care to to the people um right now it was only recently that palliative care was recognized as an important component of of care medical care and there are palliative care units that are required in each of our public health uh, hospitals um except we don't have palliative care physicians who are actually trained and who really know what this means and what it's supposed to do and what is it for and so we don't actually i mean we have units of palliative care that are not uh, staffed with palliative care trained uh, staff so we don't really have that even when there it, it was mandated to have that and now the palliative care physicians who are working and are beginning to make some kind of f- um change are private practitioners and so they are palliative care centers but they are they are small they are local they are specific to particular cities or you know so there's not a lot of access to to the general public on the other hand we have 
a larger movement of people like us who really care about these matters and who go sort of um, a little bit in, it's a, it's a, what shall I call it? It's a little bit of an underground movement of, of doctors and nurses and caregivers and just people who, who care about dignity and humanity for our people who are ill and in end of life. And we find our ways to, 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 to provide this, this level of care. But so, yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done with educating people and shifting the perspective about what it is and what it's for and how it can really support us. And that's where we're at with that. Advanced directives is another thing that is only beginning to get attention, but we have, you know, we have our whole Republic and then we have 30 odd number of states and each state decides whether they agree that it's a valid document or not. So, so we have, you know, we have to think about our medical care in relation to, to which state is going to support advanced care directives if we have them. So we still have a lot of work to do there as well. Several states have passed this as an important and valid document, but most, um, I think the, the mainstream health care system does not recognize it as valid. Um, and, and we also have a conflict between sort of family and cultural traditions versus um, legal and medical standards. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of work to do with that. And then one thing that we are focusing on is the fact that in our indigenous traditions, there is still a lot of community-based care and accompaniment. A lot of commu indigenous communities still exist that don't have access to either you know, the healthcare system or anything else. So they are still doing all of that care in their communities. And we want to look at them to have them teach us and have the rest of us remember how to go back to that community-based care rather than this individualized, uh, isolated, dehumanized care that we were talking about earlier. And so a big part of what we are trying to do is to go back to the communities and to learn from what we have forgotten. And along with that, one of the things that is, is of importance to us is that you know, green burial, what we call now as green burial, is something that was the way it was done before, right? The way we handled our remains, which was much more connected with the earth and with giving back and with reciprocity of, you know, life sustaining us and us sustaining life. Um, so, you know, as part of that cycle of life. So, so again, another thing that we are con considering is listening to the traditions of how our remains were handled and our, you know, our rights were before colonization, when we were much more connected and concerned with the well-being of the whole system that contains us and not just the human part of it. So I think in general, that's what we're doing. The other thing that we're doing is um, we are focusing on education and empowerment of the communities and people in the communities, regardless of their trade or if they even have a profession, to encourage people to reconnect with that compassionate heart that we all have of wanting to be of service and of wanting to support others and accompany others through their losses and through end of life. And so a big part of what we're doing too is we are um, training any person who is willing to be part of a volunteer team of companions so that we can, you know, our vision is that, you know, everybody eventually will be reconnected with that capacity to accompany and to go through these processes of loss and grief and end of life in community. Um, so I guess that's in a sort of a summary of more or less our concerns in Mexico. And, you know, I heard a few things that really called my attention, as I said before, one, this, the nuance of culture and subculture in how we approach um, the way we might develop this kind of support for end of life or grief um, 
uh, and then the other thing is community participation and community centered care. And I would love to hear more about that. I'll just mention that, for example, here in Mexico, there have been a few groups that have tried to create hospice care systems here, and they have all failed. And it's because the, the system here just doesn't make sense in the same way that it does in the United States or in Europe. And so we, in fact, with some colleagues in Latin America are starting to think about how can we develop a system that is, or something that can support hospice care, but that is not connected with the healthcare system because that doesn't seem to be working. Private sector alone is not, it's not working either. So how, what can we, what can emerge from this so that we can actually, uh, you know, have something similar to hospice care without the, the challenges that we have encountered because the systems just don't work in the same way. So I'm also interested to hear how other countries are, are achieving that in their own ways. And we look to India a lot with what, um, you know, Pallium India has achieved as a different model so that we may begin to establish this in a, in a more, with a stronger foundation that can last for generations. So thank you. I'll open up the floor for comments and. Could I perhaps um, just mention something? Um, I think, as you said, a lot of people have spoken about culture and the influence of culture and, and the way that people are ill and cared for and die. But when you're working with children, we have an added culture. We have the culture of childhood. And so when you're caring for children, when you're working with them, when you're learning from them, we have to respect their culture as well. And that goes beyond the culture of the, of the, the group that they come from as well. And, and it influences the way that you will communicate with them, the way they feel safe, um, the way they feel part of community. We have a children's hospice. And if you go to the European and the US hospices, I mean, I always say they're like 10 star facilities. Um, ours, the children share rooms because if we put them into a room on their own, they would feel they're being punished, that they've done something wrong. So yes, we do have a room in case a child has an infection, was really at the end of life and needs extra attention. But even when they're dying, they actually want to be still part of the community of that, um, of that little house. I mean, most of our program is out in the community. It's working um, in the homes, um, in the children's homes, and also working with the hospitals. But I think people, when they talk about culture, often forget the culture of childhood. That changes as the child grows and develops as well. And we have to relate to them in the way that they understand, the way that they communicate, um, and give them that safe space um, because often in our culture, our adult culture, we feel we mustn't talk to children about uh, dying. Um, but the child wants to talk about it. You know, so we use a lot of storytelling, a lot of poetry, dance and music, um, and of course, play and art and, and those forms of expression getting into the child's world. So that was just a comment I wanted to make about, about the culture. Rita, I thank you for that fantastic, uh, you know, kickoff because uh, there's so many themes that you just touched upon. Uh, everything from community to um, conversation to decolonization, which is so important, actually, especially for us living in low and middle income countries. And, um, you know, uh, I think what's, uh, and, and thank you, Joan, for that, that wonderful insight, because uh, that's one thing, isn't it? Communication and the vocabulary and, uh, you know, really meeting people where they are and that includes children. And if I can get a little bit, you know, um, jargony, if I may, uh, if you talk about even universal health coverage, it seems so utopian and what it's prescribing is so utopian. But I think that from where we are, we can take elements from it. And one of the things that, have, that has stayed with me about uh, the, you know, you know, the entire universal health coverage, the tenets of it is that you have to involve people in the designing and implementing of healthcare systems. And that is our missing link, which 
we really, really got to work on because, uh, and I've, I've quoted him on so many occasions, Dr. Roop Gursahani, who is, you know, uh, part of the end of life care in India task force, who says today's hospitals, especially in India, are like fortresses, the poor can't get in and the rich can't get out. And that's where the idea of the social capital comes in, which you just beautifully talked about, Gulka, which is how do we mobilize communities? And I feel that that is the beauty of palliative care, because unlike any other medical discipline, it has so many entry points. You don't have to be medically trained. I, I mean, I'm a walking example of it. You don't have to be trained in any particular you know, medical skill. Anybody who is anyone can plug into the palliative care uh, you know, uh, philosophy. And uh, we saw a remarkable experience, I mean, um, uh, example of that when COVID hit in India and when everything went into lockdown. And at Pallium India, we, we recognized that apart from, I mean, the fact that only people with COVID were being allowed into hospitals, what happens to all those people who don't have COVID, who are vulnerable, who are infirm, who are old, who are, you know, alone? And we put out a call in the newspaper asking for people between the ages of 20 and 40 who had a two-wheeler or an automobile, if they would help us just reach these people just to deliver medicine, food, to do some grocery shopping. And in 24 hours, 97 people signed up. And it was astounding. And I think sometimes we underestimate the power of community in that sense, because it was really that. Now, just one thing I wanted to say is that we talk about the Kerala model a lot, and of course I'm proud of it, but I also feel that it sometimes limits the way people view it, because it's very important to remember that it's not about transferring the Kerala model as it is, it's about translating it, because like Keshav said, we are a country of continents, and what works in Kerala will absolutely not work somewhere else. So it's about seeing that, uh, you know, what is the strength of that community, of that district, of that particular group of people. And I think uh, one of, uh, a shining example was what happened in Mizoram, which is a Northeastern state of India, where the spiritual leaders got involved. Where one day in, in one of the most important churches of the state, um, you know, the, the, uh, they spoke about palliative care. And automatically there was a domino effect and a trickle down effect where, because it's a state of like, I think 90%, you know, Christians, they adopted it. And today they do it. So uh, I think there are so many different ways to be creative when it comes to palliative care and end of life care, especially. And when it comes to the vocabulary, I think uh, some things are very localized, but I think some things are universal. We are increasingly uh, globally, um, trying to defy death, trying to you know, be a death denying sort of society. And I think it's about coming back to the basics. And to me personally, how do you do that? It's like what Joan touched upon, it's storytelling. No textbook is ever going to teach you the language of care as much as storytelling does. And um, so, yeah, that's just wanted to share that. Can I say something? Oh. No. Okay. Can go. No, no, just, it's okay. It's okay, okay, Christian. I'll talk later, don't worry. Yeah, um, thank you, Wilka, for, uh, for bringing uh, the, the conversation. Uh, I would like just to share for my, um, my opinion and my, from my experiences. And uh, uh, when I was starting in palliative care in Rwanda, um, I was so focused on uh, advocating for access to morphine because I think if we get morphine, we will solve all the problem for palliative care. Then I just realized when I was traveling, it's not because I went to those countries, they have uh, not only morphine access, but uh, hydromorphone or oxycodone and all, those painkillers and um, and the situation is some sometimes worse than uh, than in Rwanda and then I just realized maybe we we need to think um, differently we need to think differently and try to uh, to learn uh, from each other so I have um, just a few points one um, 
you mentioned about um, culture. Culture is really, really, really important because culture is um, social construction of realities of people, really building of the beliefs and the perception. And we, like an example in Rwanda, we have a saying, um, when we are well, you belong to yourself, but when you are sick, you belong to your family. So if you see on that context and bringing the patient autonomy, the one patient on autonomy we know, the standard that patient has to decide everything and that the patient uh, on, on the, the way it's understood in, uh, in Western country, that will not work at all. That will not work in Rwanda. Because when you are sick, you belong to your families because it's the family who are really in charge for everything. And we develop now a different approach. And that different approach, um, uh, we call it a butterfly approach. So the butterfly approach has two wings. So on the left wing, you have the patient autonomy. It's about the choice. It's about the expectation. It's about the privacy of the patient. But the other wing, the right wing, you have the community responsibility. It's about family, community, society, uh, which is so really important. So from the both wings, you have an intersection and it's that intersection, you have a decision making because that is really important. That is the way you respect the community. That is where you engage them. And since we started doing that, uh, I, my, from my uh, own perspective, I saw um, a lot of change because now the, in palliative care, they say we need to engage also the family members, but that is in theories. But in practice, <laughs> it's totally different. And when we're starting to engage the family members, I remember one of, uh, I, I, I set up a family member meeting and, uh, and as you can imagine in Sub-Saharan Africa, when you call a family meeting, how many people do you expect will come? It's almost the whole village. It's 50, 40, you know, people will attend the meeting. And we'll not, as a physician, I will not choose only two or three. No, I, I need to welcome all of them. And I need to develop another language to communicate, not, by, not only by the patient, but also to communicate to the whole uh, family members. And using the butterfly approach is, was really easy now because they own, they own uh, the responsibility from the patient. They also, at the same time, they respect the privacy and the choice from the patient. There is always an intersection between two. It's not one will cancel other, as we said, uh, I, I don't agree that uh, family members are, are challenges or barriers. Of course, there can be some conflict or that, but the conflict, even from the language I've learned from the family members, even when there is conflict, it's part of suffering. They are suffer to see the beloved one who is really dying. So because the patient is a source of connection, but it's also the source of conflict at the same time. So it's a language of suffering instead of saying it's a challenge. So the second point, um, it's about the meaning. Um, meaning has to be social justice and equity when we mention about palliative care. Why? Because traditional palliative care existed before more than palliative care exists. So we need to, as uh, Rana was mentioning, I think we need to stop to adapt. We need to adopt. If we start to adopt, that is a different perceptive. We, we, we bring a different approach in palliative care because most of the time we say we need to adapt WHO documents, something from, uh, from, from, from West, from East, but we forget to adopt. There is always existing practice in the local context. And that is really important. And if we need to build a global palliative care, my understanding is global is local, as local is global. So it will be difficult to connect the community without connecting the identity. 
that is how we, we will impact at the global level. And I think that is my uh, understanding um, will be one of the change we can bring in the society when we're starting at a small, just as that's a small step, we don't need to have a, a, a huge uh, um, a change in the sense of to have a, a, a global, um, you know, global fund for palliative care, then we say, oh, if you have a global fund for palliative care, then we will resolve the solution. That will not, because in, uh, uh, when I was in the US uh, last time, someone was asking me uh, during the uh, opioid pandemic and crisis in US, uh, <laughs> it was really funny when someone was asking me, do you have opioid crisis? I was like, yes, we have opioid crisis, but not as in US, we don't have opioid access in opioid. So, it's really important to understand. And the last point, uh, it's about international standard. Um, on my opinion, sometime international standard uh, in palliative care um, could become a source of injustice uh, because by not taking into account critical elements, uh, crucial in mind about dignity and sense of humanity of the patients. So yes, if we need to build a global community in palliative care, let's start at a local level. And if we start at a local level, let's connecting our identities. And if we start on identities, let's stop to adapt and start to adopt. Maybe at that sense, we will be able to bring something really different and we'll bring that sense of uh, dignity and the humanity we expect from our patient and the family members. Thank you. Uh, to continue with what Christian was saying, that palliative care is really uh, the base of life. It's what we had before. And uh, when we come, even when I was in ICU, I used to try and do palliative care because nurses, because the patients need to, to remove the guilt feeling. So uh, when they understood, when the family understood what's going on, on and what's the best for their families, they used to accept not to overdo medication and to be near their patients till the end as much as possible. And uh, when we started in Lebanon, uh, as, as I said, I, I was a co-founder co of the first home hospice. People didn't understand in the beginning what we were coming to do. And we used to ask small questions. For example, the patients at home, uh, did he had stool, for example, today? For them, it wasn't important. We used to talk about small things. And after a couple of days, they, they used to tell us, oh, now we understand what you, what you are coming. You are caring for us. You want the best for us. So it's a way of uh, give them, giving them security. And this gives them trust and gives them help to continue to accept what we're we, the what we want to offer them, and this is the way they they started accept understanding palliative care, and, and after the, de the de uh, after the patient left, they used to uh, we used to have joy when you came you come because they saw their member, family member, and this is the way people start to accept. What, uh, what you want to give. And uh, you know, in Lebanon, uh, we are a multi-religious country and we have a lot of problems. And I even was, uh, was worried today if we are going to have internet or not, because they are telling us maybe we, will, we won't be connected to the world. So uh, with what's happening now, people are not able to come to the hospitals easily. So they need this help, they need more, to be secured, more secured and not feel abandoned. And this is uh, what, uh, this is a, a, a time where we can help them more and tell them what we can, what, how we can help them because we are not abandoning them. We are not throwing them at, letting, telling them go home because there is nothing to do. No, go home, but we are with you and helping you and helping the family, especially. I tell them always, if the family is good, 
as Christian said, the family is very important in our countries. If the family is safe, they are they are good to help their their loved ones, and this helps them a lot. So there's a lot of to do, but uh, the small steps are are paying if you want, uh, helping others. To, and uh, as we are talking about the morphine, we are working on de-dramatizing the morphine. I just want to give you an example today. Uh, six years ago, I took care, I was taking care of a patient and this patient was very, very painful and the family was resistant for mor to morphine. When he took the morphine, it was the first night he sleeps well and he passed away the, last, the second day. Last week, they called me for his wife, asking me, he's very, he's in the hospital and he's suffering. And, and when we gave the morphine to my father, he wasn't, he, he died. I told them, but he slept well before dying. They asked for the morphine and she passed, she wasn't awake, but she was peaceful. She, they didn't re, hear her crying. So it was a step for them to, to stay four or five days with their mother awake, it was a, a doctor's decision, it wasn't mine, but they accepted the idea to give the morphine and see her their, their loved one peaceful at the, in the hospital, not crying, not shouting, they couldn't hear her uh, suffering anymore. So it, it takes time, but uh, when they see the, the peace in their, uh, their loved one in, in a peace, uh, peaceful situation, they accept and they they ask for it more, and that's it. <laughs> I would like to add on uh, add on the area where uh, we are talking about palliative care. We are talking about medication and the symptom management aspects of it. But looking back, if I look at my experience, uh, when do we get introduced to palliative care as grown ups also we don't know it's it's just after i have uh, i understood that you know i learned the term palliative care when i started working with cancer patients why is this dialogue not there before that uh, i studied psychology uh, in my graduation masters we were never taught about palliative care and where Whereas in palliative care, we look at the psychosocial, spiritual aspect of it. It's a major part of it. We are never taught about it. We are never uh, discussed about this. Uh, even today, when uh, on, the, on Twitter, when we saw the poster and one of the tweets by, uh, by the same uh, you know, program, uh, it's Death and Dying Expo. Looking at it, not many people would be un, uh, would be comfortable looking at it. It's like it's it's it, you know they take a back. They have taken a back on uh, what is this topic? Why are people talking about death and dying? We have to. I think uh, I'll talk the psychological aspect of it, but uh, I feel we need to demystify, normalize, and have more dialogues uh, freely on death, dying, grief, palliative care, because. Uh, most of us and people, all, all of us practitioners, I, I believe, we got to know about this. We got introduced to this only after working into this. And we also got normalized after talking more and more about it. We never talked to, uh, again, talking to children is a far, far, uh, uh, you know, it's a far concept. We will not be, because we are not comfortable talking about this. If we go back and talk to our friends that, okay, this is a program and, and you also you know, sign in for this. And these are all my psychologist friends. Uh, everybody has uh, given, you know, taken a back, okay, death and dying. We don't want to talk about that. It is happening to all educated. Uh, we are dealing with grief. And this is not a very unique uh, concept. And this is not something uh, one set of population will go through it. Most of us have gone through it. Some of us are going through it. The rest of us will go through it. So grief is a universal concept. It's a universal experience that all of us, every individual, I think, uh, grieves. But uh, sadly, we are not talking about, we do not have much dialogues uh, around grief. We do not have much dialogues around death and dying. And I think we all that we need 
uh, from the beginning from the base level is having more dialogues normalizing the concepts uh, demystifying the uh, the the concepts around uh, you know the grief and you know normalizing these concepts having more and more conversations to be able to have more conversations with our colleagues with our families with in with whatever culture we are and i think that's when the next step comes in okay what do we do about it fine we are grieving the death and dying will happen uh, but how is that we are going to deal about it and i think that's when uh, it will normalize it will help a lot of people to reach out to seek help uh, seek the palliative care uh, help uh, the second part i would like to share is uh, prevention of compassion fatigue we see a lot of us uh, we have been working in this and there are very few people who are uh, working in palliative care setup and we don't want to lose them uh, from working in that and there's a high chance because there are very few people there's a whole huge load a lot of work uh, if you look at the monetary part of it not well paid uh, i'll talk about uh, our country not well paid if you look at uh, the organizations which are providing palliative care uh, setup is not government but the ngos non government organizations where we do not have much funds if uh, so here a person who is serving with all the compassion but compassion is not going to put a bread on his plate uh, he needs money too they also have the needs and i think looking at the monetary it's one of the very basic uh, requirement but looking at the ngos are providing this support we do not have much funds on it hence uh, the funds are not there compassion is a lot we are not able to spend much time with our families and friends we take back a lot of uh, fatigue we take back a lot of because palliative care grief is not a easy uh, area to work in it it is taxing it and we don't want to lie to ourselves at least and it takes a lot of toll on us and when we go back we have higher chances of compassion fatigue and uh, already looking at few people handling a huge load we don't want to lose them and i think we need to work more on uh, preventing the compassion fatigue and to be able to think more on how do we uh, keep who we are who we have and uh, spread more dialogue and normalizing the conversations around grief death and dying uh, and palliative care thank you vilka can i just come in for a second here which uh, i really i am so glad that uh, keshav brought up the conversation on the mental health aspect because we are very keen to provide that but uh, i think what we talk about vulnerable groups and marginalized communities i think i think healthcare workers are marginalized at this point when it comes to that uh, the other thing that really sits strongly with me is uh, keshav i mean i got into palliative care when i was 19 years old because of a personal experience and i was a psychology student i want i knew right then this is what i wanted to do uh, wilka there has not been any course for someone with a psychology background in india to study palliative care till we started a program 2 years ago and it's not the most robust program it's mostly an introduction to the aspects of psychosocial care and uh, there's so much to be done in terms of you know mental health in palliative care we talk about psychosocial wellbeing we talk about spiritual wellbeing but there is uh, i don't think there's enough of an uh, effort around actually developing curriculum training uh experiential learning around that in a supported environment and um, and that's something we really need to think about because uh, in the absence of that it does fall upon physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers to be able to do it and sometimes they just i mean they're already doing so much so it's really important for us to also amplify this conversation that keshav talked about that mental health in palliative care not just as a module for us to learn but also for us to practice towards ourselves and for organizations to support it i had a incredible experience when someone told me that this concept of self care is a little twisted because uh, when you talk about self care you automatically put the responsibility on the practitioner okay get yourself some self care but unless organizations make space for that person to do it like i mean joan and uh, marie your nurses i think of the nurses in 
in India. And a lot of them are young mothers. They wake up at five, four in the morning, get their kids ready, get their in-laws, you know, uh, breakfast ready, get their husbands ready. Then they go and they do this grueling work. And then they go back and they're sitting with their kids for homework. They're preparing the evening meal. They're getting ready for the next day. Where does that woman have or the man have, I mean, any time for self-care? You know, so I think it's incumbent on us also to provide the spaces and facilitate health care, I mean, sorry, um, uh, self-care by providing those safe rooms within the organization. If you're feeling a bit off, there's a room right here, away from your family, away from your team, where you can go take a nap. And it's okay. It should be part of your organization's offering to you. And I think that's a very, very important aspect, Kesha. Thank you really for highlighting it. I, I, I couldn't... Uh, agree with you more. And the other thing is about introducing the conversation of palliative care. Increasingly, we're finding that one group to engage our students and young people and children. And I mean, the healthy ones, you know, and the privileged healthy ones. Uh, we, I, I'll give, I, I won't take up too much time. There's a small example where we started a toy donation drive, where we said, okay, we have the medicine, we have everything. What do these kids want who are coming to this clinic or not coming to the clinic because they're scared of the needles? Let's give them toys when they come. The compliance went up because what they wanted were toys because for their well-being, right? So we have funding for medicine. We have funding for equipment. Nobody funds us for toys, which is such an important part of that. So anyway, we, we started this toy donation drive. We put it up on Facebook. Within 72 hours, we had toys flying in from all over the world. And we were then giving it out to the siblings who are also very, you know, usually not in the frame. And uh, one of the things we did is uh, said, okay, let's talk to young children who are healthy and in the same age group to see how they would buddy up with the kids who are not well. I tried the experiment on my niece and nephew who are city bred kids. At the time they were 10 and seven in Dubai. And what they did is they pulled, I thought they'll give us their, um, you know, their older toys. They pulled out their best toys, made a video on how to use it and shipped it across from Dubai to India. And that is the generosity of a child. That is how we try to protect kids from conversations around death and dying. But I think there is so much power in having that conversation because these guys are going to be the change agents. And uh, yeah. And maybe to come in there, Smriti, is that children actually want to talk about death and dying. You know, we try and hide it from them, but they watch television. And what do they see, <laughs> you know? From the time they're small, they see these cartoons where the one bashes the other till they're flat. You know, those kind of things. They want to talk about it, but we just don't give them the space to do it. And, um, and I think part of what we do is just giving them that safe space where they can come and say to you and, and say, what does it mean to die? What does it mean to be dead? What happens, you know, where do I go? Um, what's gonna happen to my mom? Um, and I think that is, is just, and, and toys can be the agents that we use um, when we are explaining things. And I think of that wonderful, wonderful um, letter that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote to the child who was dying, a child with cancer, the Dougie letter, where she used the, um, the examples of nature. You know, how some flowers just bloom for a day and then their work is finished and others bloom for a long time. Um, and I think that, that children do want to talk about it. It's not the, pro the problem isn't with the child, the problem is with us, because we don't want to talk about it to them because we're not comfortable. Thank you. I wanted to share something about, you know, how we started here, um, because a, a, the group of us who is part of um, Elizabeth Cuello Ross Centro de Mexico, Central Mexico, is a group who has been accompanying the dying. When I started, I was called in as the psychologist to deal with someone who's depressed or in denial or, you know, resisting uh, medical care or, you know, being a bad patient, basically. And I would come in to discover that this was someone who was ready to enter active dying and the medical you know, crew and their family weren't letting them. Um, and I work with uh, a gerontologist, geriatric doctor and 
we started sort of working in this in this other way with patients and then eventually started um, what now is called like, you know, the death doula um, approach here in Mexico. Um, and this is just a term, right? I mean, we have men and women in communities who are doing this work uh, inherently. It's, it's, not, it's not a role necessarily, but we are sort of hoping to reawaken that in people. And so one of the things that we observed, as I mentioned to you, is that several groups have tried to start hospice care, trying to use the model that works somewhere else, and then it doesn't work here. And it falls apart because um, there's, a, there's a culture of, well, there's a couple of things, you know, there's everybody's kind of working for themselves. There's the people who are just working the same that they would work, um, I don't know, cleaning houses. They could work caring for, you know, being a caregiver in a, in a, in a center, but there is not that awakening of, of that, that compassionate heart is what I like to call it, really that, that impulse that we have to want to be part of this, to make it better for everyone. And so, so we thought that maybe what we needed to do first was to see if we could identify whose hearts were awakened and called into this work. And so we would go and give lectures at the public library and you know, in different sort of community settings to see if anyone actually feels called to do the work. And then if they do, then we train them to work with us in this volunteer team. And so when we're thinking about, you know, compassionate fatigue and all of that, it's because at this point we're working on our own. And even when we're part of a team, we are not caregiving for and with each other. We are not really working as a community. We're working as individuals in a team. And so what we have been doing is actually cultivating that team uh, heart, like the heart of a team and, and the, the mind of a team and the intention of a team. And we are, you know, first of all, we're all volunteers and, you know, we try to make sure that the basics are cared, you know, taken care of. Anyone who is able to work as a volunteer, we work together and we never work alone. So we're going into cases together. We have like a minimum requirement of three people have to work together. One case can never just be held by one person. And then we have weekly meetings where even the people who are not working on a case are part of that meeting and we share what came up in the meeting. And then we also help each other, make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And so, so this is, you know, it's something that is, it's beginning and in a way we thought, well, if we can begin this now, maybe three generations from now, um, everybody will be more working together and considering how do we care for ourselves and each other in, in a sort of community spirit, regardless of the context. Um, so this is part of what we've been attempting as a way of uh, not being alone in the work, because, you know, in a way we're working with people who are alone in their condition, right? Because we've isolated them and put them into little boxes. And then we're also isolated and working alone with them. So, so in an attempt to, to shift that, knowing that, you know, I always feel like, you know, the work will, will never be done. At least I won't see it to its ideal state, you know, in my lifetime, but I'll do the best that I can to contribute for, for our generations to come. So I just wanted to share that part. And then the other thing that is curious to me is that I've noticed that at least here in Mexico and the, in the United States and in some of Central and South America and Canada, um, there is a little bit more openness now for having these conversations. And there is, you know, the Death Cafe movement is taking, you know, is moving strongly, at least in these areas, but I think they're all over, they're in all over the world, more or less. Um, these spaces that are now dedicated to having conversations about grief and, and dying and death and all of these things. And so I'm wondering if that is something that is happening elsewhere. I know that it's happening here. In fact, in, in North America, it seems like now it's a little bit of a trend that people want to be in on to be talking about death or to be more interested in these topics. So I'm just wondering, is that is that happening elsewhere? Are you noticing that there's a little bit more opening or is it just something that's happening here? I'm just curious. Uh, I can go first. 
uh, I would like to share with uh, <clears throat> with you my. Uh, I'm planning to uh, our our article is uh, under process, and we hope uh, the article will be published uh, very soon, um, maybe this month or next month. Uh, so it's the work came from uh, uh, my thesis project when I was in Boston, um, and I was doing um, global health and social medicine. It was really I came with a very anthropological aspect in death and dying because I was asking myself and uh, why um, why in Rwanda we don't talk about death to the patients, why it's difficult for physician to start the conversation. Uh, uh, so then I came to realize after I came back in the country, do a field work for a certain period of time, then uh, it was really interesting to get the findings, um, the result from, uh, from, from, uh, from the research. One is uh, death was not a difficult conversation before the colonial periods. Death was something really normal. It was really something normal in traditional Rwanda. People was talking to death, even for children, even in the beginning. Uh, and uh, it, it was really not complicated to discuss a conversation, talk about death. Uh, and especially um, that time, um, uh, death was viewed death was viewed as an accomplishment, not a source of fear. Yeah, that was really interesting. And then I was trying to, during the qualitative uh, research and uh, everything, I tried to understand what, what was the problem. So the problem came when Christianity, during the current period, you know, in Rwanda people, uh, why death was a viewing as an accomplishment is when someone was dying, uh, all the family was really surrendered the patient. By surrendering the patient, uh, the understanding or the perception of that time is if we support someone who's really dying, we prepare the person for the next step. And that person becomes a, an ancestor who is the spirit of protection and guiding to the to the family members. So it's why in our culture, I can't introduce myself by Christian. No, I introduce myself from my father and my father introduced from my grandfather because it's really connected to that person. But when the Christianity, uh, the, during the colonial period, the Christianity, um, the perception of Christianity where uh, it's about hell and heaven, and about punishment that changed completely the perception of death and dying. And death becomes something, a fear instead of an accomplishment and changed completely the way uh, people were viewing it. Of course, that also affects the medical path, which now it's an attended consequence of the colonial period because we fear uh, death is related to, 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 uh, to hell and it's about the punishment and there is so many things, um, uh, especially during the traditional Rwanda, uh, you know, uh, when someone was really dying, all the family, especially when the patient uh, um, dies, so the family has to put the, the dead body in the position of the fetus in the mother's wombs. That is the way how Rwandans was buried the, the patient. So if someone was really seeing dying, you know, with a rigor mortis, you know, in a very stretch way, it was a bad sign because that means that person was dying alone, which is totally different now. We put someone, you know, straight in the coffin, which is totally, totally different. Yes, uh, and that is sort of so part of, uh, uh, my, my recommendation on that is, it, um, yes, we talk about education, yes, but my question is, what kind of education are we going to give? What kind of education? If it's just to duplicate 
the same model. So I don't think we create challenges by another challenge. We will be creating more challenges to the physician because that is not part of uh, uh, the perception. And then I came to realize maybe our education needs to be also uh, translated. Uh, we need to stop, as I said, to stop to adapt, but we need to adopt. And uh, now to treat a Rwandans with a physician Rwandan using the language, which is totally different to another person from another country, which is the way of understanding. So we, it's really important to understand the history uh, because now we can say we can have a dead coffee, dead cafe, and uh, we can have a dead conversation. We can bring all initiative. It's fine, but history matters. Why, where, when, and how it is changed. Then, then from that, we can learn how now to maybe adopt and see how what will be the best way to, to change. So, I, I hope. Uh, uh, because my, my target now, and I'm very soon I'll be uh, joining the University of Rwanda uh, due to COVID-19, uh, it was really uh, difficult. Uh, and to bring a different curriculum, I can use the, any kind of curriculum, but the social culture part and the histories of death and dying has to be mentioned. So then the new generation has to attend where, 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 where we failed where we fail to talk about death and dying, where do we fail to talk about death? Uh, especially in our language, we don't talk about end of life care, we, end of life. In Rwanda, we talk life until the end because a dying patient is still a living patient. So, and uh, Marie-Louise uh, who speaks French can understand well because I'm always the time I'm arguing with my, my French colleague because when I was in France, they used the word uh, accompagné um, and I told my colleagues, we don't use a company in Rwanda because if you how if you use a company in Rwanda, it's it's a very bad meaning to the family. So and the colleague, the French colleague, was asking, what word do you use? He said, we don't accompany our our patient. We live with our patients. It's about living. It's not about you know. Welcome with that, because if it's about a company, why not, why this vocabulary is not used in the beginning when someone is, is born? Why only when it's life until the end, we say, oh no, it's a company. And then say in French, it's, it's maybe a, a strong meaning because you, it's an individualist society. So if you have someone with you on the last days, it's a luxury. But in our community, we have already surrounded with that people. So we can't use a company because I can't even translate it in Kenya Rwanda. It's a bad meaning, it's a bad significance. So we need to use, in, it's why in our context we use living. So I think, um, I hope uh, learning from uh, my own history because I'm still learning from that. And uh, I hope uh, our publication will be able to help uh, my colleague, um, especially here in African uh, context, that uh, history matters uh, and then from our, the, the dialogue and the slowly we need maybe to deconstruct and then, and then maybe to cons maybe to build again uh, how uh, death and dying has to be uh, discussed in the medical field using the local context and very contextualized in that sense thank you christine i feel like coming to the university of rwanda whenever you have that curriculum going um, but i think uh, you've really Hit upon some. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very moved by what you just shared. Um, the other thing is that the language is so influenced, uh, even the language around death and dying is so influenced by success and failure and uh, winning and losing. And if you, and if you move that forward a little bit, uh, anything, especially in cancer, Keshav also will see that possibly that it's uh, about battle it's about, it's a very war rhetoric. And it's like, okay, if you, you've lost the battle to cancer, you've lost your life. You, I mean, there is no, you know, it, it, one would imagine that we are all supposed to be immortals and somebody who didn't achieve that has somehow failed in some way. And I think that sort of war rhetoric and that, that scorecard that we keep is at, at a very fundamental level that, that, that sort of rhetoric also needs to change. 
because what happens to somebody who decides that hey quality of life is more important to me than going through 10 rounds of chemo you know we we do this i've done this to people in my family when i was you know not aware of palliative care that you say no you have to fight this you have to survive it you have to do whatever it takes whatever it takes and unfortunately that is the language that a lot of attending physicians also um use and it it's so sad because it comes to even stuff like pain relief this person should be getting pain relief they should be getting morphine and you hear attending physicians say but they are not there yet why do you need to be in excruciating suffering to to be relieved of it you know so that sort of language is very important i think also to so there is the the big stuff but i think even us in our day to day language we need to stop using the battle rhetoric so much and you know today things like the tibetan book of the dead is like a very it, it's trending topic how many people even understand what that book is trying to say it's about you know what happens I mean, what does it mean to really be with somebody? Like Christian said, you know, what does it mean to be with somebody? And all of us in all our traditions have some sort of overlap in terms of forty days, thirteen days. There is a universal understanding across faiths, across cultures, that there is some there's some deeper meaning there. And I think that's what we need to revisit also to a large extent. I guess I'll just say that it strikes me very in a very powerful way to realize it, it's hard to to articulate it or to actually to admit it I think. So thank you Christian for bringing it up because the way that I perceive it many if not all of our cultures <laughs> were very connected with death as part of life and you know life sustaining death and death sustaining life and that in you know in our culture in mexico and in the caribbean the indigenous cultures also all saw death as a, as a triumph and, and as something to look forward to as as something else that was happening um and and it was part of it was it was very much a part of being alive to be walking with death living with death understanding and appreciating death as part of life and and that in a way part of what we understand here as i hear you christian also saying for you and probably probably everyone else here too is that we want to remember uh you know what we knew that somehow got cut off and you know i don't want to blame anyone or or point any fingers but but there was some we lost a lot at some point and and part of what is happening now is at least for us here is a need to reconnect with that and to remember that and to and to honor that because in mexico it's still alive and yet it's repressed it's shamed and therefore it's hidden or it's segregated out of of the mainstream um so so yeah, so so it's it's something important to consider. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for all of your contributions. Um, anything else we want to add before we close? I would like to add uh, just one thing. Um, as I've learned from my uh, past experiences, is um, one day teacher, one day student. So it's not about uh who, are, who who has the best model of care it's not about who is the best palliative care physician it's today you learn and tomorrow you teach and tomorrow you teach and the next day you learn so i think it's a mutual ex exchange mutual experiences and that is really something really important to learn as healthcare providers or palliative care workers thank you Thank you, Christian, for saying that, because I've been in the field now for 32 years, and I've learned so much from this conversation. So thank you to all of you. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to be teaching. So guess what I'm going to be taking into my teaching. But thank you all.
I've taken so many notes tonight. Uh, it's not even funny. Uh, but a few pages full of notes from everything that all of you have sh shared. So thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vilka, for. Just to say thank you very much for uh, hearing, sharing experiences, sharing culture of all the countries. I think we all have uh, all no the, the electricity was cut sorry but uh, we <laughs> but uh, uh, we all have the same ambitions we want we all want to have the spirit of helping and maybe by talking to each other and sharing all this we can uh, uh, be, become stronger to to be able to continue and uh, reach more people um, thank you very much for this uh, great discussion, and thank you very much. I think we will we will close for today. Thank you so much to each of you for taking the time and for sharing your um, very enriching and thought provoking um, contributions. Um, this has definitely been uh, very insightful to me as well. I take away some some things for thinking and I will probably be in touch with each of you later so that maybe we can think up more things that, so we can support each other more. Thank you all so much. It's been wonderful and um, we'll be in touch with you soon. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.